I'm Brian Whitker, Floriculture Extension Specialist at NC State University, and today we're going to be looking at diagnosing low substrate pH problems, the, the induced disorders that we see when the substrate is too low. So I want to start by thanking our sponsor, and that is Old Castle for the support of the NC State program. They've been a supporter for the last few years, and we want to acknowledge and appreciate their, their support for us at NC State University. So for the webinar, we're going to go over three main parts. We're going to look at typical symptoms that you see when you're looking at low pH problems. We're going to look at the testing procedures to end up to everyone needs to follow. And then finally, we're going to look at corrective procedures. So when we look at typical symptoms, there are basically three different symptom types that we run into when you, you're looking at low pH problems. So we're going to go through each one of these. And so to give you a better idea, here are a number of plants that run into low pH symptomology problems. Ageratum, dragonweed begonia, dahlia, fuchsia, geranium, gerbera, heliochrysum, marigolds are common, and then pansy, pentas, peppers, streptocarpus has problems, tomatoes, and zinnias. There's also some agronomic crops out there like rice that has low pH problems that's very common. It's the russeting, very similar to what we see on a geranium. And also you can run into low pH problems on some tobacco crops. And again, that's when the substrate pH is too low. So the, the main reason for focusing on this is that when the pH gets too low, we see there in that orange band a wider band for iron and manganese in particular and most of the other micronutrients. So at a lower pH, those nutrients are more readily available for uptake by the plant. And therefore, by having plant uptake, you can see the accumulation then in the tissue, and we see that symptomology occurring on the plant. So what kind of symptoms do we typically look for or that we see out there? There's typically three types. There's the typical blackish purple or purplish black spotting, and these uh, symptoms always appear on the lower foliage. The other one's more of this bronzing that's going on or yellowing that you see with the geranium there in the middle. Again, it's the lower foliage. When you have a toxicity condition, it starts on the lower foliage. And then I threw in that third slide, the petunia that's there. There are some crops that we classify as not having problems of low pH, but in reality, I think what we really don't realize is that when the pH is too low, growth is stalled. We just don't see symptomology occurring on those plants because we don't see the accumulation of iron and manganese in many cases in that tissue. And so we say that we've classified them as not being susceptible to low pH, but I don't think that's all the way true. I think it's more of a condition that you're looking at that the plant growth is stunted. And I think in many cases, you don't realize that the plant's growth is less and so you might not actually recognize that there is a problem going on with the plants. So when we're looking at symptomology, the important part is where are the symptoms occurring? So I have the upper leaves, and it's a little harder on a rosette type plant like Gerbera, but if it's the upper foliage having intervenal chlorosis, usually we look at, at high pH. And if it's a low pH problem, it happens on the lower foliage. So that location matters. So here's a typical bronzing that we see on marigolds. So it's, it's kind of yellowish. There's a little russeting that will come in advanced symptomology. Those are all symptoms that occur with low pH. Now, thrips have some markings on there, but you, you would see the thrips feeding. You don't see thrips on the plant. And it's a slightly different variation that's going on. And here you can see the progression. Initially, you kind of might think that you have with the leaf on the left, a magnesium issue, and then it progresses with the russeting, more of the third leaf, and then blackening occurs finally with the fourth leaf, the one on the right. And so that's the progression of symptomology, and, and it could be confused with magnesium deficiency, but a quick pour through or a media test will help you figure out what's going on with this plant. Here's a classic case of geraniums. This is probably the poster child that we see when there's problems. You have the good plant on the left, and what do you see on the right? You see the bronzing, the yellowing, 
the necrosis happening. And some of those symptomology can really develop real quickly. It can develop in a matter of just a few days that a plant can go from good to bad. And so monitoring the pH will help you avoid that situation and keep it from going too low because it takes a lot of effort to turn that plant around. It's going to cost you probably two to three weeks of extra growth to get the extra leaf area that's on there so you can have that plant sellable. So here's a diagram that Joshua Henry, he's a master student here at NC State. We were on a greenhouse tour two weeks ago. That's kind of what led to this uh, webinar occurring because we saw a few locations that had low pH problems. And so he took the leaves and made this diagram looking at the healthy leaf, which is basically at the nine o'clock segment of that diagram. And then you can see the increasing symptomology and the advancement of that symptomology due to an iron manganese toxicity. And then finally, you see that the one leaf at the end that's basically at seven o'clock uh, position, you have the necrosis, the yellowing, that leaf is basically, you can't turn it around. You're going to have to go through and pick those leaves off the plant is the only option you really have to overcome that problem. Here's a problem of step streptocarpus that we had. I initially thought it was phosphorus deficiency because they were grown a little cold, but we did the pH test and the pH was 4.5. And we also reported this situation in eGrow Alert 329 uh, two years ago, if you want to look at that for more detail. So this is more of the the blackening symptomology that we're running into. We have a little bronzing, the blackening going here, going on here with ageratum. Uh, again, the lower leaves where you see that situation occurring. And then with Gerbera, you can see that there's more of a spotting, and this is very advanced symptomology going on in this plant. This was from one that we saw this spring just two weeks ago also with the low pH situation going on with it. And here's the progression of symptomology going from more of the blackening initially with the green to more advanced conditions going on and then, then yellowing occurring also with that leaf over time. So you, you're not going to turn that around because actually what we're looking at there is cell death. And so you cannot turn that around with any type of fertilization routine to get a better looking plant. Here's pepper, again, lower leaves. It's more of a blackening, purpling of those lower leaves that goes, goes on with the crop. The same thing occurs here with nasturtiums, more of a speckling. Again, lower leaves, not upper leaves. That will help you diagnose the situation that's going on. Again, blackening of xenia, low pH, that's what's occurring. And then I want to talk about the third type of symptomology that goes on, and that's more stunting. And here is a study we did where we varied the rate of lime that we added to the mix, the substrate mix, and then we had the resulting pHs, 3, 3, 4, 8, and above 5. And then you can see the corresponding reduction of dry weight as compared to the highest rate of lime. So you can see that at very low pHs, while we didn't see any symptomology, what we saw was less plant growth. And so that's what you sometimes see on some plants when the substrate pH is too low. And you might not suspect it because you don't see any leaf symptomology that we typically associate with low pH problems. Same thing going on here with poinsettias. And interesting, when we did the test of the tissue, we did not find elevated levels of iron and manganese in that tissue. They were within the normal range. So tissue testing will not always help. You're going to have to rely upon a pH test of the substrate to figure out what's going on. So testing procedures, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is to go through and do an in-house pH and EC test. It doesn't matter if you're doing the pour through, the saturated media, or the one to two. They all report the pH in the same way. It's only the EC that varies. Now, you oftentimes ought to keep track of what all the nutrients are in balance with the plant just to make sure everything is going the way as planned. And that's where a complete substrate analysis would be a good idea to use. Finally, the other factor to look at when you're trying to confirm whether or not you have a low pH problem is getting a tissue analysis. Now, the challenge that comes in is that we most commonly look at sampling the most recently matured leaf. 
What is that? That's the leaf that's up towards the top of the plant that just finished expanding all the way out. That's the most recently matured leaf. The good thing about that is that compares the nutrition in your plant over time with some published standards, and that's a great thing. The problem with that is where's the symptomology of low pH problems? Is it at the top of the plant or is it the bottom of the plant? It's at the bottom of the plant. So we're not sampling the tissue that has the symptoms. And so it would be a good idea until you become familiar with the symptomology is to go ahead and take that second tissue sample of the lower leaves so you can see what's going on. So, okay, in-house testing, just go through, pour through SME. That is step one to keep track on those plants that have problems with pH going too low. So going through a procedure that way is a great idea. So on the tissue analysis concept here, so here's the plant of Gerbera. And like I said, that we typically sample the most recently matured leaves. That is denoted by the blue circle on the top of the plant. But if you sample the lower leaves, that's where the symptomology is at. So let's look at, in contrast, what's going on with this. So here is the results of those two tissue samples. Now it's the same set of plants. I just took upper leaves or lower leaves. And look what is the big problematic area. Now again, we look for, and when the pH is too low, what do we look for? We look for micronutrient accumulation. So what do we see there? We see much higher levels, you know, look at iron. Upper leaves, and, and mind you, 752 part per million is probably three times higher than it should be because there were some leaves that were showing some symptoms. So that is that is definitely high. But the point is, look at the lower leaves. We're at 3,080 part per million. So you can very easily confirm your diagnosis by having that second tissue sample. So that's what, what the point of here is is taking that second tissue analysis sample. So to capture that or sample those lower leaves, and then you know what's happening and you can confirm what's occurring with lower leaf pH induced problems. Here's some other plants, lower leaf black speckling caused by low pH. And also look that you're seeing the accumulation of iron and manganese, the same speckling starting to happen on the flower. Most unusual, this crop was grown very cold in long term, and that's where we were seeing the problems occur. And so we, we also did the tissue test. So the yellow bars indicate the, the lowest level. The blue area indicates where the recommended range would be for those three elements. And you can see here where the, the levels actually were. So they were quite a bit higher. So again, taking those lower leaves will help you diagnose the problem, and then you'll have a better idea what's going on. Because I know when I first saw th th this problem with pansies, I had never seen it before, and I was wondering what else it could be. And finally, you know, I took the tissue sample, and, and I had the pH an, uh, analyzed too, so you can figure out what's happening with the plant. We did an eGrow alert earlier also on low substrate pH on uh, Christmas cactus. It's in an eGrow alert, but you can see we had, a, in this case, a substrate pH of 4.34, so quite low, and that's what you're seeing as an iron and manganese toxin toxicity occurring with that plant. Dragon wing begonias, the same thing occurs. Typically the plant stalls. You start seeing that speckling on the close up of the leaf on the right. You can see the same symptomology going on there. And we also had this in an eGrow alert two or three years ago. And we did tissue analysis again, and you can see that the iron and manganese are in fact high. And there's the eGrow alert. It's 2.23. So corrective procedures for this is you need to know what factors influence that pH drift. So if you, you have problems, things are summarized in eGrow Alert 4.02. So you can download that so you don't have to write things down. But both for increasing the pH and the lowering the pH, we do have that in an eGrow Alert. So first of all, when you're looking at trying to control it, know what group your plants are going to go in. So some plants like the geranium group want the pH higher because they're susceptible to low pH problems. Others are more general. And then the petunia group wants the pH lower because it's more susceptible to iron problems. The green bands where you want it to be, the yellow band would be the area where you need to start making changes to your pH of that crop. So again, another way to look at it, the three groups and the crops, 
why we're avoiding certain situations that the pH is too high with geraniums, you get iron chlorosis, and if the pH is too low with a group like geraniums, then you have that low pH problem occurring with those plants. So what do we need to do? We need to increase the pH up to acceptable levels, and that will help overcome the problem. And so what are the options available for this? The first option is flowable lime, hydrated lime, and potassium bicarbonate. So looking at all three of these, flowable lime, and there is a new Calox product from BioSafe that works very similar. One to two quarts per 100 gallons of water it can be used. Uh, if you go higher than two quarts, you can't do it through your injector, but you can, you can use that to help increase the pH for both of those products, and that's very commonly used. The old-fashioned way is using hydrated lime. Mix one pound in three to five gallons of warm water. Mix it a few times, let it settle, decant, and apply the liquid through the injector at one to 15. Now, keep in mind, this is caustic for both you and the plants, so don't breathe the, the dust, don't get it on your skin, and also wash the foliage. Potassium bicarbonate will work. Uh, potassium bicarbonate at two pounds per hundred gallons. You need to rinse the foliage to avoid the burn, and it provides a lot of potassium. So therefore, you need to leach heavily the following day with a complete fertilizer that restores the balance of nutrition and also gets those salts out. So really above two pounds per hundred, you might run into some vital toxicity conditions going on. Here's some work by Paul Fisher looking at the response rate. So if you're looking at the bottom bar, two quarts of flowable lime, that gives you about a half a pH unit increase. If you look at potassium bicarbonate, one pound gives you almost up, you know, a half to six tenths of a pH increase. So you might want to go through and do double applications to get the the pH back up to where you want it to be. But this gives you an idea of the relative uh, reactivity of those chemicals to help improve the pH of your substrate. Here's a look at just over time that Paul Fisher did. So initially it comes up very quickly. So you can retest in two days to make sure things are where it needs to be. And then it holds for a few days. Now, after about two weeks, you might have to reapply because uh, most of these products are not overly long lasting for what you want. And here's the information looking at the EC and the green line, that initial uh, blurb going up, that is because um, of the high EC content of that potassium bicarbonate. And that's why one needs to leach it to get it back down. With a flowable lime product, you do not see that increase of EC on those plants. So in conclusions, as we close down here, that there are three main types of symptoms that we look at. We have the bronzing of the lower leaves like a geranium. We have the blackish purple speckling like we saw there with a, with a gerbera. Or we have a lack of growth that we can see with a poinsettia. I've also seen it with a mum. So you need to know what the optimal ranges are because you don't always see visual symptoms. So you, you need to know those ranges for each plant and what you're targeting for. Monitor the pH to make sure that problems are prevented so before they occur. And then uh, submit a complete substrate sample. You know, it's a good idea on some major crops on a monthly basis so you know what the complete feed is in that substrate. And then if you go to tissue sampling, most recently mature leaves, the standard, but you might also want to do this symptomatically so that you know what's going on on the leaves that are showing damage. So with that, I want to again thank Old Castle for the sponsorship of the webinar, and we'll open it up for questions.